was officially succeeded by his grandson, Leo II. But since the new emperor was maybe only six years old, power really wound up in the hands of Leo I's son-in-law and Leo II's father, the Isurian general Zeno. Zeno had risen to prominence as part of Emperor Leo's push to get out from under the domination of Aspar and the Germanic commanders who had dominated the court of Constantinople. Leo had used the debacle in North Africa, among other things, as an excuse to turn on the man who had made him emperor all those years ago, and in 471, Aspar and his son Artabor were executed. Zeno, meanwhile, was a leading member of Leo's new favorite clique of military officers, and he was married to the emperor's daughter in 466. When Aspar fell, Zeno stepped into his place. When Leo died, Zeno became co-emperor along with his son Leo II. When Leo II died that November, Zeno claimed imperial power for himself. The official report says that Leo II died of natural causes, but conspiracy theories abound about who really killed the boy, and I, of course, tend to believe that Livia did it. Fortunately for Julius Nepos, Zeno seemed amenable to the idea of ousting Glycarius and backing Nepos' claim to the throne. After all, as Leo's chief military advisor, Zeno had almost certainly come up with the idea himself. So in June of 474, Julius Nepos and his army sailed from Dalmatia, down around the Italian peninsula, and landed at the mouth of the Tiber, probably on the right bank, at the imperial port of Portus. Glycarius appears to have been alerted to the fact that Nepos was sailing around Italy, and he rushed down to Rome to meet him. Whether he intended to offer up any resistance is an open question, but when Julius Nepos docked, it was immediately obvious that his forces were much stronger than anything Glycarius had at his disposal. As I said, Gundabad was still up in Gaul while all this was happening, leaving Glycarius to deal with the invasion by himself. It is also possible that he rushed down to Rome to take the pulse of the Senate and see where they stood. Were they disposed to back him, or would they abandon him for the newcomer? The newcomer, Glycarius gave it up. When Nepos arrived, Glycarius was there to meet him, and he surrendered without so much as a sword being drawn. Glycarius was in his mid-fifties, and had been emperor for just over a year. Nepos, for his part, took this bloodless victory well, and instead of killing Glycarius, he followed the lead of Ricimer and Majorian, and made Glycarius a bishop, specifically the bishop of Salona, the major port city in Nepos' home province of Dalmatia, which is more famous to students of Roman history as the city where Diocletian retired to following his abdication in 305. With Glycarius out of the picture, there are now just two emperors left. Unless you believe Julius Nepos, and lots of good people think that we really ought to believe Julius Nepos. After being accepted as emperor by the Senate, Nepos set to work laying the foundation for his long and glorious rule. His first order of business was officially firing Gundabad and elevating a Gallic native named Ecdicius to the rank of Magister Militum. Ecdicius's main claim to fame was that he was the son of Avitus, and if Julius was going to ever have any hope of recovering Gaul, he was going to need the support of the Gallic Romano nobility. Since most of them still carried a torch for Avitus, Avitus's son was brought into the administration. With Ecdicius almost certainly doing the negotiating, Julius Nepos got his reign off to a fine start by working out a land swap peace deal with Euric and the Visigoths. In exchange for the Gothic withdrawal from Provence, the Romans would grant them title to lands further north and west, but they had no hope of reclaiming right now anyway. There is some disagreement in the historical record about how and why this plan was approved, with some blaming Ecdicius for blundering away territory. But the general consensus seems to be that this was Nepos' conscious plan from the start, to maintain a geographically contiguous territory and worry about unreachable pockets of Roman territory, like the domain of Soissons, later. The chroniclers, like Jordanus, 
who tend to blame Ecdicius' blundering, use that alleged blundering to explain the rise of Orestes. Because in early 475, Orestes was suddenly and inexplicably made Magister Militum at Ecdicius' expense. Orestes was a soldier and politician of Germanic descent, who had once upon a time been attached to Attila the Hun's court, serving as a secretary and diplomat for the Hun king. When the Huns sent envoys to Constantinople to demand more indemnity payments, you can be sure that Orestes was on at least a few of those missions. After Hun unity was shattered after the death of Attila in the 450s, Orestes appears to have drifted into the western orbit, and by the 470s, somehow, he had become a prominent member of the western establishment. He was also the father of a young boy named Romulus. The exact reasons for his elevation are obscure. Either it was indeed because Ecdicius had free lamps to deal with the Goths over Nepos' head and so he got the big ugly axe. But another explanation is that the elevation of Orestes was engineered by the Senate, who, though they technically acquiesced to Nepos' rule when he had a very strong army in their backyard, were now trying to undermine him. In this telling, Ecdicius was not recalled to Italy because he was being fired. He was recalled to Italy to help Nepos fend off a possible attack by the suddenly emboldened Orestes. Whichever it was, in mid-475, Orestes organized a revolt against Nepos in Rome. Whether the emperor was in Ravenna at the time, or whether he just fled there when he found out what Orestes was up to, is unknown. But it seems pretty clear that Orestes marched north at the head of some kind of army, and Nepos, fearing for his life, boarded a ship and fled to Dalmatia. Though he would never relinquish his claim to power, he would remain in Dalmatia as a quasi-private citizen until he was finally killed in 480. During the five years he spent in Salona in exile, his personal bishop was none other than the deposed Glycarius, which I believe marks only the second time that two former emperors were able to get together and just kind of shoot the breeze. The first being the brief imperial summit attended by both Diocletian and Maximian in 308, after the Tetrarchy started to break down. When Orestes arrived in Ravenna and found that Julius Nepos had flown the coup, he decided to take the logical step and seize power. But probably due to his Germanic extraction and old connections to Attila the Hun, Orestes didn't presume to claim the throne for himself. Although, that said, no one really knows why Orestes did not proclaim himself emperor, or why his son would have been more acceptable. For example, Gibbon simply states that it was, quote, for some secret motive, unquote. Whatever those secret motives were, on October the 31st, 475, 14 or 15 year old Romulus Augustulus, the little Augustus, was proclaimed emperor in Ravenna. So now you can see why Julius Nepos keeps raising a stink about how he's really the last emperor of the Western Empire. He had the backing of Constantinople. After marrying one of Leo's nieces, he had ties to the Eastern Imperial family. He had been driven off by an illegal coup led by some barbarian secretary of Attila the Hun. His successor was a 14-year-old puppet. So why does he get to be the last emperor of the West and not me? I'll still be claiming imperial authority until they kill me in 480. Shouldn't the fall of the West at least be linked to my death, not the exile of some anonymous kid? Well, unfortunately, that's not the way history remembers it, my friend. But your objections are duly noted for the record. Julius Nepos was in his mid-40s, and he had been emperor for just about a year. For another four years, until he was murdered in 480. Orestes settled into Ravenna to lay the groundwork for his own long and glorious rule. But unlike Nepos, who actually got off to a fairly decent start, Orestes started screwing things up right off the bat. Shortly after seizing power, the new puppet master of Italy was approached by a group of federated soldiers 
who demanded what soldiers had been demanding from time immemorial: better pay and more land. Orestes, feeling awfully secure in his position for absolutely no good reason, refused to grant any sort of concessions. So the soldiers went to their captain, who just so happened to be Odoacer, and asked him to please do something about this joker calling the shots in Ravenna. Odoacer agreed to do something about him, all right. In August of 476, Odoacer told him that if they wanted, he would lead them in revolt against Orestes, that he would rid them of their problem, and if all went well, rid them of haughty imperial bureaucrats forever. Five days later, Odoacer marched on Ravenna and caught Orestes near Piacenza. The little snake was trying to sneak away. He was executed immediately. A few days later, Odoacer entered Ravenna, killed Orestes' brother, occupied the imperial palace, and tracked down young Romulus Augustulus. Taking pity on the boy, who was, after all, just a puppet of his father, Odoacer decided to let the boy live, and he exiled him down to an estate in Campania. Romulus Augustulus was maybe 15 or 16 years old, and he was emperor for 10 months. So, no, the Western Empire did not exactly go out with a bang. After deposing the boy emperor, Odoacer collected up the imperial regalia, put it in a package bound for Constantinople with a note for the emperor Zeno. There is no longer any need for separate empires. A single emperor is enough. I will rule Italy in your name, but don't bother sending any imperial replacements. With that, the line of Western emperors was truly broken. Yes, yes, Julius Nepos, I hear you wailing over there. But did you ever make it back to Italy? Were you ever able to wrest back control of your empire from Odoacer? No? Well, okay then. You and Glycarius go back to playing backgammon or whatever it is that you do. So, that's it, right? I mean, here we are. Today is someday. It is 476 AD, and Romulus Augustulus, last emperor of the Western Empire, has just been exiled. The History of Rome podcast, as once upon a time defined by me, is over. But it wouldn't be very nice of me to just go off and leave you like that. So we will be back next week for one final episode. All good stories have an epilogue, so the history of Rome shall too have an epilogue. A chance to wrap things up, ponder all the stuff that comes after 476 that we didn't get to, wonder aloud why the West fell but the East kept right on trucking, and gaze in awe at the legacy of the Roman Empire. Are we going to stumble upon a grand unified theory of Roman history? I doubt it. But it will be good to digest what we've all been through and what will come next. So I will see you next week for the final episode of the History of Rome. Unless, of course, we have a baby in the next seven days, in which case, see ya. This week's episode is brought